that John Sawat used to give his Dharma talks during the meditation. He'd usually start out by saying to approach the meditation with an attitude of respect, an attitude of confidence, because we're doing something important here. We're not just sitting here breathing. We're training the mind so that it can find true happiness. And that's an activity you want to respect. One, you want to respect your desire for true happiness. Don't let the world tell you that it's impossible to find a happiness that's beyond conditions, totally reliable. Because they want to sell you there are lesser forms of happiness. And so they teach you to have doubts about the possibility that a true happiness can be found. The Buddha didn't talk in those terms at all. He said it can be found, and it can be found through your own efforts. And where do your efforts come from? They come from the mind. So the mind has to be trained. Because if it's not trained, it has this habit of creating a lot of unnecessary suffering and stress. So this is our major responsibility right here, is looking after the mind. If we take care of the mind, then other issues take care of themselves. Even if you have past karma, a well-trained mind can help you withstand the results of past bad karma. The image the Buddha gave is of a large lump of salt. He says if you put it into a small cup, put a little water in, could you drink the water? Well, no, because the water would be way too salty. But if you found a large, clean river and threw the lump of salt into the river, could you drink the water in the river? Well, yes, because the amount of water is so much larger. He said in the same way, an untrained mind is like that little bit of water in a cup. Any bad thing comes as a result of your past karma, and the mind is totally overwhelmed. Whereas if your mind is well-trained, expansive, he says, and this means two things. One, that your thoughts of goodwill, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity are totally unlimited, immeasurable. Then two, that your mind is not the sort of mind that can be overcome by feelings of pleasure or pain. That if pleasure comes, you don't get worked up about it, and pain comes, you don't get worked up about it. If you've trained your mind in those two ways, then it's expansive. It's like the water in the river. So those are the two things you want to focus on. One is developing these attitudes. We call them the Brahma-viharas, the sublime attitudes. And you want to practice in making them limitless. It's not just that you can feel goodwill sometimes, or compassion sometimes, for some people. You want to train the mind so you can feel these attitudes for everybody, people, animals, everywhere. You start with yourself, but you don't end with yourself. You think of how the suffering of others doesn't benefit you in any way, so why would you wish suffering on others? And if you see other people suffering, the automatic development of goodwill is it turns into compassion. If there's something you can do to help those people, you try to help them. If you see the people are already happy, Goodwill develops into empathetic joy. Modita is the, the Pali term. You don't get jealous of their happiness. You don't get envious. You don't feel that their good fortune belittles you or makes you any less. Because after all, when you have good fortune, would you like people around you to be envious? Well, no. Or resentful? No. And then in areas where you can't be of help, 
That's when you develop equanimity. And this applies to yourself, to the people you love, or situations that you you don't want to see happen, but it's just the way things are. You want to be able to develop equanimity in every situation. So the Buddha has you practice these things in your meditation. Develop goodwill for yourself and then spread it out to people who are close to your heart and then out in ever-widening circles. And ask yourself, is there anybody in the world that you have trouble feeling goodwill for? And you find there are people that you really dislike. The Buddha is not telling you to be dishonest with yourself or to pretend that you have feelings that you don't. But he takes goodwill as the standard. And then if you find there are people who just really have trouble feeling goodwill for you, you have to stop and ask yourself, do you benefit from their suffering in any way? And the answer is you don't. And when you wish for their happiness, basically you're wishing that they would understand the causes of happiness and act on those causes. So it's not like you're trying to go around with a magic wand and make everybody's minds happy magically. You're hoping that they will understand the causes of happiness and act on them. That's what goodwill means. And then you do the same for compassion, the same for empathetic joy. With equanimity, the Buddha has you remember again the principle of karma. There are certain things that are going to be influenced by past karma, and after you've tried to make a difference and you find you can't, you simply have to accept that that's the way things are. Not so they become defeatist, but simply realizing that if you pour a lot of energy into an area that you can't make any difference in, then you're wasting your time, you're wasting your energy. That energy that could be usefully used with other people in other areas. So when you're developing these Brahma-viharas, you want to be as wise and discerning as you can, because they are a way of developing discernment. It's not just a, a nice thought or a restful place to put the mind. But as you're developing these attitudes, you want to develop the discernment that is realistic, clear-eyed, so these attitudes really can apply to your day-to-day -day life. Otherwise you find yourself sitting there thinking, thinking thoughts of goodwill, and then you get out on the road and somebody cuts in front of you in traffic, and all of a sudden you're thinking black thoughts about that person, as if your meditation had nothing to do with what's actually happening out there. You want to develop these attitudes in such a way that they really do apply to difficult situations in life, because that's when you really need them. That's when you can develop that mind like a river full of water, clean, pure, something you can be happy to drink no matter how much salt is poured into it, because the water is just so much more. The same principle applies to developing the proper attitude toward pleasure and pain. When you sit here in the meditation, there are going to be pains. There's got pains in your legs, pains in your back. And if you find yourself defeated by these pains, you're going to have a lot of trouble in life. Because the pains of aging, illness, and death don't last only, say, for a half hour or an hour. And one of the sad things of life is that, especially toward the end, is there's a long illness. Most people with untrained minds, their minds grow weaker and weaker through the illness, and at the same time the pain grows stronger and stronger, and so they're totally overwhelmed. And they start thinking about the future, and they realize there's this big blank wall. So the minds immediately revert to the past, and they start feeding on thoughts of the past, and many times if the mind is weak, some thought of something unskillful they did or something somebody else did. They get really worked up. So you've really got to strengthen your mind so that it's not overwhelmed by pain. And again, this means not just sitting with it, but also learning how to understand it. 
what is the sensation of pain? What's the difference between the pain, say, simply of the body or of the aggregates, and the pain that comes from craving and ignorance, clinging and ignorance? That's an important distinction, because it's the second kind of pain, the clinging and ignorant pain. In other words, the pain that infects the mind. That's the one that really makes you suffer. And it's what takes the pain of the body and imposes it on the mind. Because if there's no craving, if there is no ignorance, then the pain in the body is just there. The mind can be aware of it, but it's not overcome by it. So on the one hand, as you're sitting here, you have to have the right attitude toward the pain, that this is something you want to study. It's not something you just want to get past. You want to study this issue of pain. And that requires that the mind have a good, solid foundation and concentration, which is why we're sitting here breathing in such a way as actively to create a sense of pleasure. That's the foundation the mind is going to need, because if its pleasure comes only from nice things outside, it's going to be constantly running away from pain. But if it has an internal source of pleasure, an internal source of ease and well-being. then it doesn't feel threatened by the pain in the body. It can investigate it and notice at what moment in the mind, what does the mind do that inflicts the pain of the body and makes it an issue in the mind? What kind of perception of the pain does it have? How does that perception create a bridge into the mind? So try to develop the qualities of mindfulness, alertness, concentration, and discernment. so we can see into these issues. In other words, so you learn how to use pleasure, learn how to use pain. So that pain isn't something you try to run away from, and pleasure isn't something you just run toward. You want to learn how to use them as tools so you can gain understanding. The greater the understanding, the more the mind becomes free of the influence of pleasure and pain. So these things don't overcome the mind. So you can develop that mind like a river full of water, clean, pure. So even though big lumps of salt get thrown in, as the Buddha says, you hardly notice them. That way the mind can rise above its conditions. expansive, free. So this is something you can do with the mind. The mind can be trained in this direction. But it's each person's responsibility. As John Swat used to say, each of us has only one person we're responsible for. You can't be responsible for other people's behavior, even people in your family even your own children, to say nothing of the other people you meet in the course of the day. So you waste your time hoping that they'll be nice like this and nice like that. You're neglecting what is really your responsibility, is making sure that your mind is strong, expansive, well-trained. So make sure that you Take the time to carry out this responsibility, because if you don't do it, nobody else can do it for you. And if you don't do it now, one, you're just leaving yourself open to a lot of suffering, and two, it's not going to get easier as you get older. It's not something you want to put off. So be very clear about what is your responsibility and what's not. As the Buddha said, this is the sign of a wise person. You know what your responsibility is and you do it. As for things that are the responsibility of other people, you leave them alone. It's a very basic level of wisdom that we tend to overlook. 
But as is so often the case with the really basic teachings, it's really important. So you always have to keep it in mind.